Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Richland, Ohio. NPDL is live at the Richland Correctional Institute in Mansfield, Ohio, here today with Liberation Allowed, NPDL's newest franchise. And joining us to help launch this historic new team here in Ohio is Indiana University. Joining us, the Hoosiers, welcome, welcome. My name is Daniel Troop. I'm the founder and executive director of the National Prison Debate League. And you are all in store for a real treat today. Let me tell you, there are no inferior minds behind these walls and you're gonna see that on full display. And there are not gonna be any inferior minds from Indiana here either. These are top policy debates and it's not easy to do what these folks are about to show you. So we hope you buckle in for a heck of a debate because what we're, we're gonna witness here is an unforgettable display of both social diplomacy and intellectual ability fully displayed on a very challenging policy topic. Today's resolution, the US should raise the upper sentencing age jurisdiction for youth to 21 years old. In the affirmative, we have liberation allowed arguing in the affirmative supporting this resolution and Indiana University today will be arguing the negative position refuting that case. Each debater will be judged on the following criteria from a distinguished judging panel, which we'll introduce in a moment. They'll be judged on analysis, reasoning, evidence, organization, reputation, and delivery. The three very distinguished judges I just alluded to, our chief judge today is the former director of debate at University of Georgia, Mr. Ed Panetta. Ed, welcome. Also judging today's debate will be the director of debate at Michigan State University, and she is also the 2010 National Debate Tournament champion. She is no joke. Harley Watson from Michigan State. And rounding out our judging panel today is the senior director of civic and community engagement at Emory University in Atlanta, and he's also the executive director of Atlanta's Urban Debate League, Mr. James Rowland. Welcome to Emory. We also are blessed to have some amazing volunteer coaches in the league and coaching our two teams here today, who, Patrick Waldinger. Patrick is, yeah, Patrick coached our Liberation Allowed team from Ohio. Patrick is our NPDL volunteer coach. He's also the president of the American Debate Association and the co-director of debate at the University of Miami. So Patrick, uh, thank you so much for working with this group of guys. And we also have Mr. Brian DeLong, who coached Indiana University and was kind enough to bring his team in, into the prison here to debate Liberation Allowed in person. So Brian, thank you and your team for joining us. This is how we build, build bridges, people. We just build them and then we use them. It's easy. And I hope America's watching and taking notice because it's not that complicated. You got to open some doors, maybe crack a few windows, but amazing things can happen when you do. So let's all let's all uh, let's all embrace this amazing debate we're about to have. As your moderator today, I'll be introducing all of our debaters individually. They're all going to adhere to specified time limits. A digital timer will be displayed on the screen, and at the conclusion of the debate, the judges will tally up each speaker's cumulative points to determine the total uh, team score for each team. We'll get a winner announced at the end. So without any further ado, I'd like to get this debate started. Your first speaker representing Liberation Allowed for seven to nine minutes. He's their first affirmative constructive speaker. He's a family man and believer in doing what's right. He wants his legacy to be those in, in who he loved and the wisdom that he's passed on to others. He's traveled this, this world over and hopes every place will be a part of himself. He also wishes all people to feel connected to each other like we're here today to do is to connect. So can't wait to hear from this first speaker from Liberation Aloud for seven to nine minutes. Please give a warm welcome to Mr. Noel Cole Jr.
In the summer of 1992, I became a United States infantry soldier. I spent 16 months fighting every urge and every desire to kill. Everything is in front of me. The military didn't teach me. It grew me. It taught me I was a typical 18-year-old who could not understand patience over action. I then, they used science to teach me not to charge. All historical evidence showed 18 to 24 was the best time to mold me into what they wanted. Ladies and gentlemen, judges, tonight I will show you evidence and science that will never allow you to sit by and continue allowing emerging adults to be the victim of our broken status quo. Tonight, we resolve that upper sentencing be raised to 21 years of age with no exceptions, bringing an end to another lost generation. We also wanna bring one law to every state in our union. I will lay it out in three steps, starting with defining emerging adults, politics, and last, public safety. According to Jeffrey Arnett of Clark University of Atlanta, it is the critical developmental period between childhood and adulthood. I'll start with science. The first juvenile court founded in 1899 knew that youthful offenders were profoundly different than adult defenders. In 2005, Roper versus Simmons ruled on what they knew 106 years ago. The Supreme Court stated neurobiological research proved brain development was not fully mature till 25 years of age. Ladies and gentlemen, science proved that. Three different cases relied on evidential support and science to show emerging adults are impulsive and risk takers. Roper, Graham, and Miller relied on briefs filed by studies done by the American Psychiatric Association and by and by the Justices of excuse me, American Psychiatric Association and proved by the justices of the Supreme Court that emerging adults overuse their amygdala, and that is why everything is emotional for them. Now let's start with adulthood. Could you see the magical change at 18? I couldn't, couldn't even feel it. Society says they can't be trusted to drink smoke or purchase bullets for a weapon. That is evidence-based. Insurance companies use science to charge them more on premiums till they're 25 years of age. How can we charge them more? How can we charge them in adult court when society requires them to pay more or have a co-signer? I'm going to break it down into three easy groups. Group one is the military. I told you, they train us, they use science to turn us into something else. Group two is society, and it uses science and evidence to make your adult parents sign for your first everything. Now the third group, the judicial system. It rejects both science and evidence to say 18 is mature enough, stable enough, and has the wisdom to fight a system that is stacked against them. That is a fairy tale. Our reality is true. Everything has shown in the last several decades that the courts have failed to keep up with the sciences of emerging adults. That's reality. We resolve that a uniform federal law that protects mental development of emerging adults till 21 years of age. A system of reforms that puts rehabilitation and justice hand in hand so that another generation is not lost. Now my second point is politics in our court system. Now I want you to remember, every politician wants to be elected and reelected, so they refuse to reform a system built on the foundations of classism, discrimination, judicial and prosecutor's discretion, and politically motivated laws. These must stop leaking into our court system because justice is supposed to be blind, but we know it's not. Now let me give you an example of how states use the judicial and the prosecutor's discretion plus politically motivated laws to affect court decisions 
In Miller versus Alabama, the Supreme Court ruled no juvenile court, no juvenile could be sentenced to life without parole. In Miller versus Riley, they upheld the judicial of the prosecutor's discretion to impose 85 years on this emerging adult. Pretty nice sidestep to the Supreme Court and the elected politicians called it a victory for all voters of justice. Now a little story from me. My 18 year old son and his two friends explored an abandoned factory earning a charge of burglary and criminal trespassing. But guess what? I used white privilege, yes, I'm telling you, I used white privilege to get the charges dropped for my son. One of my, friends sent, one of my son's friends was not that lucky. Even though he was white, he was poor. Now, every job interview my son goes on, he is celebrated for his military service and everything that he's done, while his friend always seems to be and has to defend his felony conviction. conviction. Being white with resources and the automatic advantage to our status quo. Works for me, truthfully, sucks for most. Especially according to the studies at Harvard Kennedy School that stated Hispanics are three times more likely and blacks are nine times more likely to be charged as adults than whites. That is why we need to abolish the prosecutors and judicial discretion in this matter, taking it out of their hands and never allowing anyone under 21 to be put into an adult court system. I come to my third and last point, public safety. The Massachusetts justice system for state government studies showed 76% of emerging adults will reoffend within three years of leaving adult prison. That is, that is an absolute fact. I will state we are not looking to let emerging adults off free are without accountability at all. We want to mix and we want to use science and evidence to protect our cities and our families while giving rehabilitation mixed with an environment to heal. Data collected from Massachusetts Justice and Harvard shows emerging adults are open to intervention focused on rehabilitation. Can we not agree, all agree sending emerging adults to rehabilitative setting is better than sending them to the jungle of an adult prison? In fact, studies by the U.S. Justice Department shows 69% given this will not reoffend, and it shows it stops the next generation. Hello? Oh, okay. Now that's public safety. Speaking of public safety, what about these young people? Vermont's Raise the Age Initiative and Coalition for Juvenile Justice study showed emerging adults are five times more likely to be raped, raped, and nine times more likely to commit suicide because from the time they step off the bus, they are targets of the predators. I'll give you some simple truths. If you give a person education, job skills, and a way to redeem themselves, they are more likely to. Ladies, gentlemen, and judges, that is hope, and that is powerful. In conclusion, I've given you knowledge about a vulnerable group in society called emerging adults. I pray you will see this group needs our protection, and most of all, not our damnation. With that, I conclude. Right, good. Main here at Knoll. And coming up next to the lectern from Indiana University for one to three minutes cross examination, we're going to introduce Indiana's first speaker. She's originally from Valparaiso, Indiana, studying, she's a senior studying international law and French language. And a fun fact about this next speaker, she's looking forward to law school next year. So she's in the right place. She gets some clients uh, waiting for you, I'm sure. So uh, let's introduce Indiana's cross-examination speaker. Please give a warm NT NPDL welcome to Miss Annika Fish. Come on down, Annika. Ready? Yes, ma'am. All right. 
So first off, how do juvenile courts currently, so how will juvenile courts determine the differences between 18 and 21 year olds and the different ways they can be punished? Well, we're always going back to the science. It's always the science. Okay. The amygdala states that 25 is the mature age. Okay, then why is 21 the age that the affirmative has chosen to defend? Thank you for that. That's a very good question. You got to start somewhere. You can't throw it all into a bushel. So you start with 21, but the science proves, and that'll eventually be something we'll debate next year with you, mm -hmm. raising it to 25. So the implication is that inevitably states are going to continue to raise this age. That's where we need one federal law because states okay. like to have their own business. And we've proven that does not work. Where are you from? I'm from Indiana. Okay, Indiana. What's the age of what's the age of adult? There is um 17. Okay, have you ever met a 17 year old who didn't have to have his permissions to drive the car? Did you ever have a 17 year old who had his own credit card without anything? Do you think he should be able to go to court and stand up on his own? Um, I mean, we'll defend our arguments, but absolutely. So what is the process for raising that upper age? Are you going to create a new system or are the emerging adults going to be taken into the juvenile system? Well, this, that is an excellent question. Truth of it is, is for many years now, a lot of the, a lot of the states around us, Connecticut, Vermont, even Michigan, mm -hmm. which we have somebody here from Michigan who's there, has started that process. So what we're going to do is, is we're going to use that to go farther up. Mm -hmm. There is no perfect system. We both know that. You going into law has proven there's things that you want to change or you wouldn't go into law. Yeah. So you take those three that are good and you try to bring it all the way across. There's going to be mistakes. But the truth is we've got to succeed. All right. So looking at the plan tax that like, you defended, you talked about not having any exceptions. Does that include for violent crimes, murder, rape? I like that. You must be a fellow Republican because that's the argument I use immediately when I'm defensive. Okay. It's such a minute amount that gets so much attention, but it's not actual. actual. You remember the 90s super? No, wait a minute. You don't remember the 90s. You were in diapers. <laughs> Anyways. Nice. So... The next question that I have is, why is smoking and drinking the correct age to move things up to rather than being able to take out hundreds of thousands of dollars of student loans, going to war? Well, you, okay, that's a political thing, and I'm glad your generation is going to fight that. But truthfully, that's not really what this is debate's about. Oh. This debate's really about let's get things to where they need to be to protect the emerging adults. All right. So my last question for you is, what do we do with current 18 to 20 year olds that were convicted as adults? Well, we would we would review that and we would send it back. We would establish putting them back to where they need. Do you not? Uh, the, the biggest thing for us today is to show. Time's up. All right, that was a spirited exchange and cross. So we want to keep the flow going and introducing the negative team's first speaker from Indiana University, their first uh, constructive argument for seven to nine minutes. This next speaker is out of St. Joseph, Michigan, but originally hails from India. And she's studying marketing and professional studies. And an interesting fun fact about our next debater, but this is a new one for me personally. Um, these held me down for many years while I was inside. So um, our next speaker has a fear of nachos. I don't know how that works, but I love nachos. And I hope that that's, I'm glad that's not what we're debating today. So please give a warm welcome to Miss Vishnu Minithuri. Minithuri, please. Can I move this just to the side? Okay, just hold it up. Yeah. 
Hello, everyone. My name is Sai Vishnu Singh here in my mid of 30. Before I begin, I have a few thank yous, or we have a few thank yous. Thank you, National Prison Debate League and our opponents, uh, Liberation Allowed, for this opportunity to have a fun and robust debate. I'll be delivering the first of the speech now. The age of 21 is arbitrary, harmful, and far short of needed justice reform. It threatens the rights of young adults and leads to higher costs and failure to deter crime. That's why we need the resolution resolved the United States should raise the upper age sentencing jurisdiction for youth to 21. Before we begin, we would like to introduce the following framework. The, ad the affirmative must explicitly, explicitly defend the age of 21 and not simply raise the upper age. If they cannot prove, provide, the next, if they cannot prove that 21 is a specific age that must be implemented or that it is better than any other age, such as 18 or 25, the negation should be misdebated. I will introduce our first two contentions, and Xander will introduce the third contention, contention in our second negative constructive. Contention one. Contention one is a form kind of thing. The prison system was created with the goal of public safety rather than rehabilitation of those Jews. Because of this, any actions within the system without steps to towards decarcerization, decarcerization will have half measures. According to Eric Reinhardt, physician anthropologist of law, psychiatrist and public health at Harvard University, to wake over natural carceral nightmares, we will require, will require forcing large scale decarcerization upon unwilling system administration administrators. Therefore, the United States should one reward states that shrink their prison population by 20% over three years with an extra three years of funding. Two, afford states with the freedom to implement this funding on the basis of local considerations within a provided slate of 21 policy options to choose from. Three, require states to con convey, convey an advisory board composed of diverse array of local stakeholders, including former incarcerated people. Four, prohibit states from enacting punitive sentencing laws such as mandatory minimum rules while receiving federal funding. And five, provide funding to programs led by former convicts that aid their, in their rehabilitation. These proposed proposals were supported by the Brennan Center of Justice in March of 2023. There are three benefits. First is limiting incarceration. According to the NYU School of Law Brennan Center for Justice, as of 2016, nearly 40% of the U.S. prison population is incarcerated without a compelling public safety justification. Creating funding incentives for states to free prisoners would result in state governments reconsidering who is currently incarcerated and encourage alternate sentences for new or ongoing trials. Second is improving public health and safety. According to Dr. Reinhardt, in 2021, at least 12 states have closed prisons over the last year in connection with staffing shortfalls and reports of systemic abuse, violence, and generalized disorder. According to the Bureau Research Advisory Board, these conditions and incarcerations with large at best has diminishing impact on crime, has little to no effect, and at worst, actually increases crime in certain communities, causing worse outcomes for public safety. Third is rehabilitation. For providing aid outside of prison system is necessary to avoid recidivism. recidivism. Thank you. In the future, often ex convicts are forced to engage in criminal activity because they cannot access employment opportunities. Providing funding and aid from former convicts with similar experiences improves rehabilitation outcomes and creates stepping stones to elimination. I'm sorry, I have a hard time pronouncing words. Contention two. Contention two is still over. We are constantly trying to balance the rights of protection, to protection and the rights to participation, says Warren Goldford, law professor at Wallamette University and the founder of Schools Child and Fantasy Advocacy Clinic. There are four key areas that spill over effects, social, voter rights, parental responsibility, and the military. First is social spillover. Sociocultural markers that point towards the Gulf are becoming less attainable for young people today. According to a survey conducted by the University of York, Buying a home, having children, and starting a career, career were the formal hallmarks of adulthood. That as these benchmarks become economically unachievable, adulthood is up for debate. The harm of civic participation. Emerging adults are already less engaged in political systems. According to Scott Foster, a Democrat from Virginia who was first elected at the age of 22, young people don't see themselves fit for roles or have an impact. And even after young people run, other emerging adults are unwilling to vote for young candidates. According to Ben Meng Zhang, who ran for city council as a college senior, convincing young people that he was qualified was more difficult because young people struggle to imagine themselves or someone like them governing. Foster continues, if laws were skewed against young folk and public perception is skewed against young folk, it's that much harder to get involved. It takes extra effort and vote power. Second is voting rights. After World War II, many states across the Union has vote, had voting age limitations to 21 of age or older. 
The assumption that was that younger populations were, were not considered full adult citizens with their respective rights and privileges. A growing movement in a, of Americans recognized that if soldiers can fight against Nazis at the age of 18 for their country, and if citizens can be conscript, conscripted and jump on forces to fight in, in unpopular wars like Vietnam, we should have a say in who represents them in Congress. In 1971, Congress finally passed the 26th Amendment, the affirmative change proposal that we should not consider 18 to 20 year old adults, but something in between is exactly that type of quasi adulthood argument that could justify a reversal of rights that are currently granted. Can't guaranteed by the 26th Amendment. If 18 to 22, 20 year olds are not adults within the law without a capacity to understand consequences, then how can the 18 year olds in the voting booth understand the consequences of their vote or for the law or representative? As a voting group, young adults can be some of the most important voting blocks in the nation, and politicians recognize this. A lot of these rights and maps, due to change in how law and society view legal adulthood, could be detrimental to other legal rights that young generations need to have a voice on, including what about the reproductive health, privacy law, minimum wages, and the rights of young workers and various industries. Third is parental responsibility. Before 2023, Taiwan had a disjunct of legal environment where 18 year olds were treated under criminal law as adults, but under civil law, they were still considered emerging adults. And 18 to 20, 20 year olds were unable to enter contracts, take out student loans for school, for example, without parental signatures. The law required parents of 18 to 20 year olds still had to financially support their children. If an 18 to 20 year old caused property damage or could be sued under civil law, the parents also bore financial responsibilities. The shift in adulthood proposed by the affirmative could have awkward impl implementations on American cultural understandings of family, 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 and even legal issues like tax law and financial dependency. After the advocacy, parents may be partially culpable for the behavior of their 18 to 20 year old kid, where they are legally responsible to give time and money and assist a young adult after a crime, but the parent would be unable to claim the person as a dependent. These financial consequences may be devastating for some families with parents who are reaching retirement age or are already financially strapped, covering the costs associated with raising younger children. Four, surround American military recruitment and legal imprisonment. Under the international law, laws that the United States helped craft through the United Nations, children's soldiers are not considered culpable for their actions. Rather, they're considered victims of circumstances. The United States heavily relies on recruiting military personnel at 17 and 18 years old. The Marine Corps from this thing, 48% of their candidates at this age and only 11% above the age of 21. The Army recruits 37% of their members between 17 to 18. The theory that affirmative proposes that is that the theory that the affirmative proposes is that at this age, these recruits should not be considered culpable for their behaviors, which presents a problem. Currently, all U.S. soldiers must pledge to follow the U.S. military code of conduct and by proxy the international laws that the United States has ratified through treaties. The problem will include one, either the U.S. military will be misaligned where 18 year olds will be tried in the military for most culpable people, but not criminal courts for the same actions. Or two, the military aligns itself with a 21-year-old legal status, and the U.S. will not be able to recruit emerging adult soldiers. If they can adult, if they can recruit young soldiers, these persons may fall within an odd quite quasi-culpable zone as soldiers in war. In the article, European Journal of International Laws, titled Does and should international law prohibit the prosecution of children for war crimes? It cites examples of groups like the Islamic slate recruiting 16 to 18 year old children to heinous acts of violence. So after the article proactively asks whether these persons should be prosecuted and what should be similar to a change of status of murder cases. This article does beg the question on whether American 18 to 20 year old soldiers could commit extra legal acts of violence or war zones, then claim lack of responsibility for their actions. Examples of soldiers committing significant crimes in the Afghanistan and Iraq war would suggest that these are not uh, unpredictable outcomes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so to provide cross-examination for liberation allowed, we're going to introduce the next speaker. He's from Toledo, Ohio, originally. He's a father of a beautiful 10-year-old daughter. He's also a strategic communicator who loves to have the opportunity to speak on issues of race, class, and gender. So he's in the right discussion today. Please give a warm welcome to liberation allowed, Mr. Tyru McClendon. Hi.
Is the system racially biased against youth of color? I would say so. You say so? You agree? Oh, you would agree with... Sorry. So you would agree the, with the calculations from the Human Impact Partners on 88% of youth tried as adults are youth of color? Yes. So you would agree that that percentage alone is unjust? Yes, I would agree that that is unjust. But you never spoke about race in your instruction? Um, we added that part kind of in the counter plan, having a diverse administration to oversee people who can be, um, when they're charged, have a diverse people keep on looking to make sure there's no racial bias. What evidence do you have that refutes the brains do not fully develop, fully develop until after the tumor? I don't think we read any evidence to say. You didn't read, you so said it. We didn't read any evidence. You didn't read, okay, right that. on. And assurance, if assurance companies, rental companies, credit card companies, other private companies utilize science to dictate responsibility of use 18 to 25, then why wouldn't our federal law do the same? I'm sorry, could you repeat that question? Get to a different region. Um, did you know that some rental companies, credit card companies, and other private companies utilize science to dictate responsibility of use 18 to 25? Why shouldn't our federal law do the same? We're under our counter plan, they we would be looking at all of that as well. We have our counter plan for that reason. To do be you know what to... affects developmental behavior? Uh like environment. Like what effects de uh, developmental yeah, behavior? Developmental behavior. Yeah, it, I mean, it depends on person to person. Some people are okay, to, to the Games spectral that. cortex. And then I forgot the other one. Forgot the other one? Yeah, I mm -hmm. believe it starts with C. Did you know when the federal tough on crime bill was passed in the 1990s that it made it easier for youth to be tried as adults? No, I don't know about that. You didn't know that? So you must not know that Vermont, Connecticut, amongst others, got these laws reversed due to adolescent development and neuroscience. I do now. You do not right now. I don't know what the question yeah. was, I'm sorry. Okay. Your counterpart asked about violent crimes and about mm -hmm. punishment. So your team stands for retribution more than rehabilitation? No, we believe in rehabilitation. And we just also believe that the amount that people are given to serve their punishment is too large. So we're through our counter plan, we can reduce that and not give them like 85 years as their previous, I believe 85 years. Ago. Why would you dispute a plan that would add equity to America and then a burden? We're not, we're through our counter plan, we're still doing what the affirmative is doing, but in a better way. Rather than Thumbs up. Okay, next up from Indiana University, we're gonna hear some more from the Hoosiers on this subject. In case we haven't, we're gonna hear from their first rebuttal for four to six minutes. You've already had a small dose of her, so we're gonna bring her back. Please re-welcome to the listener now for Indiana for four to six minutes on rebuttal, Miss Annika Fish. <laughs> All right. Is anybody not ready? All right. Firstly, I'd like to start by re-explaining our um, framework here. So first off, we don't have to defend the status quo. The act is going to have to defend 21 specifically rather than any evidence based on 25. Vishnu was specific on this within the framework, but I think it's important to reiterate. Additionally, To do some clarification based on process, um, the necessity of balancing public safety and racial justice is considered by the negation, and it's necessary to make sure that we hold these two things in balance. We understand that there is systems of racial violence within the United States. However, making sure that we balance public safety with forms of significant violence is also an effective. 
To continue with responding to my opponent's arguments, I'm going to start with their first uh, contention, which I have labeled as emerging adults. Top level here, they must have been 21. In process, they said that there were studies that were specifically talking about 25 year olds. There needs to be specific arguments about how like, 21 is the specific age that should be changed. We have a few arguments here that I'm going to make talking about how 21 is a bad number. First off, small steps fail. This is from uh, Lattimore, who is in a uh, study who studies criminal justice, and the study is from 2022. The study specifically talks about how, in writ large, there are many different reasons why individual and small prison reform makes it extremely difficult to have any future change. This is a type of this basically means that we're going to have a stopgap where instead of being able to have any future change, 21 becomes the end point. There are three main issues of this. The first is that people are going to see this and decide that 21 is the correct age and move on from that. That's just like a human change. The next is programs. Rather than creating new programs to manage things outside of prison, to manage things in prison and improve the ability to be rehabilitated, but instead there's going to be a lack of, um, like there's going to be poor implementation that happens here and it will end up just reaffirming the status quo. Next is methods. And overall, these methods are consistently overpowered and unlikely to scale the hurdle used to identify statistically significant effects. This means that overall, this 21 age mark is not actually going to have any change. Additionally, our next argument is that wide scale incarceration is the only way to have this change, which is one of the main points of the counterfeit. Having this 20% decrease in incarcerated people over three years is necessary to have any actual movement towards change and get over that hurdle to have any future actual impact. Additionally, based on their scientific arguments, there are two arguments here. Um, conceptualizing adulthood is considered almost impossible based on an age standard. This is from the Society for Research and Child Development. It is impossible to understand writ large that 25 year olds all have a developed amyg amygdala. Everything is individual and changes. Next, 21 is a bad number because 18 to 25 year olds are emerging adults. And without changing those conditions for 21 to 25 year olds, we will end up having no changes. Um, that's from the main law review. Next, I'm going to move on to the um, arguments about the reform that they're making. Um, top level, they are defending the system by inherently just going back into the status quo and recreating these systems rather than doing a big decultural change. The age of moving to 21 doesn't actually change the system itself. And this directly reflects into any kind of race-based inequity arguments that they're going to make because rather than having any actual change, the system continues and chugs along and we just say, oh look, 21, that's good, right guys? But it's not good enough. So that's why you have to perform the counter plan. So the next argument is that any of the specific anecdotes that we're given should be grouped. And I'll have two arguments here. The first is that they can't explain how they through the affirmative, are able to resolve any of the issues that were brought. There's going to continue to be these um, differences between how now juveniles are going to be treated. Maybe young black men, instead of being able to go and um, go do community service, they have to be within the juvenile detention system. There's still going to be inequity between these different sentences. Um, it's just an argument about how there's like an inevitability within a racist system. Uh, the last argument that we have is about public safety, and there's going to be specific, specific arguments on this in the third contention that Sanders are going to make in the next negative constructive. However, just to give like a brief preview of that, top level public safety is worse when more people are in prison, so decarceration is necessary, and the safety, um, yeah, so just overall that should be considered. And the final argument that they made was talking about how emerging adults are often the victims of rape and suicide within prison. And I would like to bring up the argument about how there are individuals who are going to be within these juvenile detention systems who are 13 within the same place as 21 years. When asked in process in the first speech, there's a specific argument about how there's new systems being made. So it is concerning to have 13 year olds and 21 year olds being in the same space, trying to be rehabilitated in the same way. Um, additionally, there are Harvard evidence from the first, the first contention that talks about the violence against racial minorities proof that there's going to be continual hurt within the system because the system itself is the problem. Thank you. Great job, Annika. Next up from Liberation Allowed, providing the affirmative team's
first rebuttal argument for four to six minutes. Our next speaker from Liberation Allowed is from Mansfield, Ohio. He recently received his associate's degree in communication from Ashland University. His mother was a middle school teacher, so I guess it's no surprise that he also likes to help and mentor youth. And uh, we're really excited to hear from our next speaker. So please give a warm welcome to Liberation Allowed's Michael Martin. That's okay. I appreciate it. Um, good evening. According to BJ Casey, who works from the Department of Psycho Psychology at Yale University, brain development is a fundamental human right that is denied to juveniles in the criminal justice system across the United States. Studies done by neurologists, by neuroscientists at the University of Minnesota also believe that the prefrontal cortex does not even begin to develop until around the age of 21. To 25. <laughs> so many things as I come up here because I would like for it to be understood that eventually we will get to 25. But right now, that is not where we would like to start. We would like to start in slow steps as we've always done in America to always get where it is that we need to be. People say that experience is the best teacher. While that may be true, I, we, the affirmative, believe that if you go through something and you experience it, it's only good if you understand what it is that you are experiencing. When you are navigating through this in this world from a place of authenticity and emotional maturity, you are aligning yourself with internal clarity. That is a product of your heart, your mind working in harmony to guide you on a path from an adolescent to becoming an adult. These are things that you must learn, and every there are things that you must learn in everyday life in order to succeed and become the adult that it is that you need to be. They want to shrink the population in prison with no plan. Our team has a plan, and that plan is to get us to the next step. These people that go to prison, 99.2% of them will be released, which means that they will one day be your neighbors. Therefore, there is a public safety issue. So why would we shrink the population and not have them be rehabilitated? Therefore, they are showing that we live in a system that prefers retribution over rehabilitation. We, the affirmative, do not stand for that. Dr. Robert Kershaw, who is the executive director of the Center of Law and Brain and Behavior at Massachusetts General Hospital said, the science is on the sides of raising the maximum age for juvenile offenders. With that being said, he understood that there were steps to be taken to get there. So he didn't ask for it to be jumped there. He understood what we must go through as a team and as a collective to make one another better, to help our safety for the public concerns, for the science of nature, and for the science of nature, Dr. Francis Sheen, who is the director of Sheen Neural Lab, said 18 is not a magic number for brain development. But neither did he say that 25 was. Why? Because he understood that there are developments in the middle. As males, we develop different. As women, we develop different. And we have to come to a collective understanding and agreement to get to where it is that we need to be so that we can all stand on one, on one facet. And with that being said, she said if they shrink the population by 20%, that they would give the funding back to the states for several years. But if you shrink in the population by several percent, then you are talking about crimes that already have been committed. So you're paying for something, a mistake that could have been prevented. We the affirmative, we want those, that money to be understood and to be took in and given to the community. Because community disinvestment is what causes most of us to become here. People such as myself who felt as though the need to do other crimes and cause other actions that we did not, that I did not need to take but I did not understand that because I was young. The community disinvestments brought things like poverty to my front doorstep. When you understand poverty, poverty creates stress. When you understand stress, stress creates childhood traumas. Childhood traumas have long-term effects. Long-term effects bring people of black and brown and disadvantages of color all into these type of populations where their minds are shut down and where they're bottled in. We the affirmative do not agree with that. We understand that there is a challenge. We understand that this is not something that will be changed overnight. But we we stand for something. And since we stand for something, we will get through this. And we want them to understand that they need to agree with us to get through this so that they can understand that this is not 
And I repeat, this is not something to be taken lightly. Like I said, this is a challenge. Everything faced can't be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And with that, I relinquish. Thank you, Michael. That's actually brought us to the halfway point of the debate. Do you believe it's uh, flying along all this policy talk? And here we are cruising to the halfway point. And to lead us in starting off the second half of this debate will be Indiana's very own negative, second negative constructive argument for six to eight minutes. This gentleman is also from Valparaiso, Indiana. I have a feeling he might be related to the other debater on the team with the same name. I just figured that out. I'm a little slow, folks. That's why our debaters handle the heavy lifting here. Um, but no, it's cool because I love to see the diversity, even with the studies. Uh, this individual is studying law and public policy and declaring for international relations in the fall. And fun fact about this next debater, he really likes cooking and watching YouTube videos on food science. And it's not exactly food science, but the National Prison Debate League does have our own YouTube channel where you can catch all our dope videos. So check that out, maybe add that to your list. But please give a warm welcome to Indiana's Xander Fish. I always like to start from my favorite. I'm going, I'm going to be giving the negative third contention, and then I'm going to be going down the uh, affirmatives attacks on, or going through their rebuttal on our uh, negative speech. Uh, our third contention is the terms. Compared to even also 18 year olds with a respective increase in punitive sentencing, there is a positive correlation with reduced criminal behavior across society as people age. This means the question should not be about adulthood markers, rather, it should be focused on appropriate levels of punishment to deter the behavior that society deems problematic. At the negative team, we can agree that some punishments are beyond reasonable, and we can advocate for better and more just reforms of true correctional institutions, but ad hoc expansion of a juvenile correction system is not the appropriate solution, as we and the query of Berkeley in 2016 explained. Standard economic models of crime imply the participation in crime should drop discontinuously at 18 when sanctions become more punitive. The point estimates from our discontinuity analysis indicate an approximately 2% decline in the rate of criminal offending when a juvenile turns 18, when the expected incarceration length conditional on arrest jumps to continuously by roughly 230%. This suggests a small reduced form of elasticity. While our findings point to small deterrence effects on of prison, this does not mean that prison is ineffective in reducing the overall incidence of crime. A fruitful avenue for, re uh, for future re research would thus be an investigation of optimal sentencing structure. This is key to balancing rights to protection and participation, as Ben Ford in 2020, a law professor at Willamette University, explained, we're constantly trying to balance the right to protection and the rights to participation. The affirmative entirely upends this, as 21 is a horrible number to try to put at the upper age sentencing. As 18 to 25 year old was the affirmative explicitly conceived in their first argument on, uh, on science, um, explaining how there is still brain development until 25 conceived. Where without changing conditions for 21 to 25 year olds, they aren't making significant change. They will maintain the status quo and will further the systemic failures of the juvenile justice system. This is from Boston 22 from the University of Chicago Law Review. State interventions can help individuals grow up or can stand in their way. Most young adults will desist regardless of state intervention. Some will be thwarted by the state's incarceration policies. Brain and behavioral maturation continues until roughly 25, which the affirmative concedes. By extending juvenile exceptionalism to this age, it would therefore be consistent with the court's developmental logic. Don't they have to be held to their standard of 21? They have given you specific evidence on the age of, 20, uh, on the age of 25 still being in a developmental age, which means that you should prefer the age of 25 and reject all of their evidence on the age of 21. This deterrence argument has two key impacts. The first is cost. 
Parents should be required to pay for juvenile court costs according to Hager in 2017. Parents must pay for detention where bills run up to $1,000 a month. Many can afford monthly installments of only $5. When parents fail, the state can send collection agencies after them, tack on interest, garnish 50% of their wages, seize their bank accounts, intercept their tax refunds, suspend their driver li driver's license, or charge them with contempt of court. This puts families in debt while failing to bring revenue to the state, which is less effective than adult criminal courts, according to Lydia Sanders and Han in 2017 from the uh, Dolores Bar Weaver Policy Center. They explain the collection efforts are particularly ineffective in the juvenile division and the cost of fee collection is more than what can be recouped. Moreover, currently we do not have enough funds or space for more juvenile buildings, according to Reynolds in 18, 2018. Law enforcement officials express uncertainty over the impact of legislation on their departments and whether or not money by the state would cover the shifting costs from state-funded correctional facilities to local government. Concerns among local officials over where some of these offender, offenders will be sent, um, uh, where they have two options, to either build their own facility for $600 million or to come together with other counties to build a regional facility with limited beds. Counties across the state may find themselves competing with others for places to house those convicted of crimes. The second impact is systemic failures. Affirming the resolution forces thousands of 18 to 20 year olds as well as 22 to 25 year olds into the juvenile justice system, which maintains and worsens the corrupt and negligible effects it has on the individuals within the system. As the University of California in, 2020, in 2022 explains, the uh, juvenile justice system is worsening the adult system and creates long lasting effects on juveniles uh, Racial disparities are evident, with Black and Latino males disproportionately represented and youth who identify as LGBTQ. Youth held in the juvenile justice system have minimal access to enrichment and educational opportunities without access to quality health care and other basic needs. Allegations of abuse are routinely re reported, and research has demonstrated the impacts of the abuse and neglect on adolescent neurodevelopment and behaviors. Even in the presence of education and life training skills, uh, environmental onslaughts leave a lifelong imprint on neural structure and functioning where the juvenile justice system operates in a manner akin to the adult system, meaning it is not better and forcing more individuals into this system makes it worse. This is furthered by the Children and Youth Services Review in 2023, explaining that the juvenile justice system was initially formed, suggesting focus on, re on rehabilitation. However, many approaches have been implemented, yet the system has struggled to appropriately respond. Racial and ethnic disparities are pervasive within the juvenile justice system, indicating the system does not serve all youth equitably. The justice system involvement in childhood and adolescence has significant negative effects on youth's life trajectories into adulthood, including low educational or vocational attainment, persistence of mental health and substance use problems, and future justice involvement. Compounding these, young people of color experience disparate treatment and uh, permeate every decision point in the juvenile justice process, with youth of color more likely to be arrested, detained, and placed in residential settings than white youth. On to their rebuttal speech. I'm just going to go down their entire facts. First off, they tell you um, that. Uh, First of all, they tell you that brain development is fundamental um, and that we have to, um, th that they are defending 21 to 25. However, again, they give you specific evidence on how brain development continues until 25, yet they sustain this argument of 21 throughout the entirety of their affirmative speech. They directly contradict themselves within their first case, which means that you should be rejecting their argument of 21 just off of those statistics alone. On top of this, when we put it at it, or on top of this, they tell you that eventually we will get to 25, however, this is entirely untrue. We already put the age at 18 in the status quo, and it has stayed that way for a reason. The legal systems and the precedents which these uh, which this sets disallow for the, the actual change in the future. If you set it to 21 now, who says when it would actually be brought up to 25, which will just cause all of the disparities which I gave you in that third contention to continue to persist until we actually make it 25. They give you no time frame and they give you no actual reasoning for how changing it to 21 will lead to 25, which means you should reject it. Um, also, then they tell you, um, then on to how they talk about how uh, shrinking it um, doesn't or like hurts the system. First off, the counter plan gives incentives to increase rehabilitation to DQ populations. It doesn't simply let people out. It is specifically trying to uh, focus on how um, to shrink the population through rehabilitation. It doesn't remove these rehabilitative processes from these individuals. And uh, also, they tell you that uh, science is on their side. However, again, this science argument turns against them when they argue that 25 is the developmental age. They argue 21. You have to hold them to that. If they're going to argue 21, but then give you science about it being 25, why are we still defending the age of 21 and not 25? 
Then lastly, they tell you that the funds should go to communities. However, the, the fifth plank of the counter plan also solves for this when it explains that there are people within these communities that are getting these funds towards the rehabilitation and creating a um, advisory board in order to do the process through um, all of that. Um, and then lastly, just um, again, hold them to the line of 21. They give you evidence to about the about the 1825 um, and all of the contentious yeah, you need to respond to their um, public safety efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Xander. Next up, our, our next debater is someone who loves working with people and sharing the word of God. So I hope you're ready for a sermon because our next speaker is literally the faith-based Bible instructor for Richland Correctional Institute. He's also a former high school city tennis champ. So we want to give him his due there as well. The guy's got range. So let's see if he's got the vocal range. Six to eight minutes. David Mathis, come on up, buddy. Good evening, good afternoon, excuse me. Let me just say, there's a critical question before us this afternoon. And it must be answered by each one of us. That is, when will we, as a society, accept the overwhelming scientific proof that emerging adults are living, reacting, reasoning, and committing criminal acts with an underdeveloped brain. According to the analysis by the American Bar Association, while juveniles can legally be tried as adults, there is a profound difference between the adult and the adolescent brain. The difference boils down to the lack of prefrontal cortex development in younger brains. This section of the brain controls, among other things, the ability to consider consequences and one's susceptibility to peer pressure. So in other words, what happens is they live in today's moment and they miss tomorrow's atonement. And February of 26, 2020, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, a collaborative effort involving delegates from emerging adult juvenile system, practitioners, juvenile advocates from all over the country, neurologists, sat down together for a meeting of minds. And at the conclusion of that meeting, they came and release this statement of fact that reads like this. Listen, emerging adults are more likely to be impulsive and less future oriented and more violent and emotionally charged situations where most crimes take place. So just for a moment, um, let me extend and reiterate this neurological argument. According to Dr. Kinshaw, the executive director of the Center of Law, brain and behavior at the Massachusetts General Hospital said, the science is on the side of raising the maximum age for juvenile offenders. They need to be held accountable in ways that are developmentally aligned rather than support divers of future criminal acts. Then he goes on to say the age of full criminal jurisdiction should be raised to 21. The age of 18 has no scientific biases. So at this point, I'm intrigued. And at the same time, I'm ushered into a moment of truth. So just for a moment, imagine with me, please come with me. Uh, the population in question being a seed, a seed to reach its invisible potential, it must be placed in a germinant environment particular design as a breeding ground that is favorable for growth and development of emerging adults. 
uh, to choose this environment, I'm going to take a page from my opponent's parents or guardian's repertoire. Here's what they did so correctly. They identified that specially designed breeding ground, better known as college campuses. What they are doing is operating under a term called present value. According to Webster Merriam Dictionary, present value means this, a sum of money invested now at a given rate, we'll call that tuition. A sum of money is invested now at a given rate, and then it is communicated or accumulated to a specific amount at a specific future date. We'll call that four years in a bachelor's degree. This is how they work. They place their investment or college student in a seating ground called college campuses. There you will find a formation of healthy bonds, like-minded peers, they have access to counseling, to develop a sense of social and moral responsibility, which positions them for a promising future. And may I add, they are around some of the smartest people in the country called professors. This all takes place between the formative ages of 18 to at least 22 years old. Now, allow me to contrast between emerging adults and emerging adults who are just as impacted. College emerging adults spend four years in an environment that is conducive to growth and development. Why Dr. Catherine Monahan of the National Institute of Health shows that you who come in contact with the adult criminal justice system at a heightened risk for arrested development. In college, you leave with a four-year degree and keys to a bright future. Well, in prison, they may leave with a four-year degree. However, it's attached to community control, permanent record that limits housing and job opportunity, and therefore become a prime candidate for recidivism. And before I conclude, there's an elephant in this room. It must be addressed. And that is systemic racism in our criminal justice system. After this address, you will know without a doubt that we have to raise the juvenile upper age sentencing to 21 with no exceptions, not even prosecutorial discretion. So far, prosecutorial discretion have looked like this. Data collected by Harvard Kennedy School, the Malcolm Weiner Center for Social Policy states that in almost every state in the United States of America, disparities have been found to exist. These differences cannot be explained by the differences in criminal history, nor offending behavior, or difference in racial or ethnic groups. That same study shows the national data and disparities also exist in court-involved emerging adults. For instance, 18 and 19-year-old Black males were found to be in prison at a rate over nine times greater than Caucasians. In other words, for every nine Caucasians, there was 81 Blacks in prison. One thing we have to remember is that the system for a collection of people, people who make decisions, bring their biases and prejudice into those decisions. And this is how we end up with disparities like the one I just mentioned. So what should we do? We have to take it out of their hands and we have to do it legislatively. We cannot leave room for individual bias. Individual bias turns into collection of individual bias. Time's up. That's time.
Next up, also from Liberation Allowed, providing their second affirmative rebuttal for three to five minutes. Our next debater hails from the east side of Cleveland. He's an organizer, activist, and social commentator. He's also a freelance writer. And fun fact, I think he's the only debater here taller than me today. So please give a warm welcome to Liberation Allowed's Talib Abdul Qadir. All right, all right, all right. You got him? All right. Now let me say this much, right? I agree. I agree that the system is broken. It's not working. I'm proof of that. I believe we all are proof of that. The system is broken. I also agree with my young opponents that we should be incarcerated. If it was up to me, I'd empty this place out. Everybody can go home, right? Now listen, my young opponents, they raise some issues. They talk about how societal norms will shift. When we talk about societal norms, we are not talking about science. We are talking about societal norms. And societal norms change according to the societies that they are normal in, right? So we are not basing our argument of 21 on societal norms. We are basing our argument on 21 on science. Also, raise the issue about not raising it to 25. Let's not make the perfect the enemy of the good. We start at 21 for a reason. We are in America. I don't know if you all have been paying attention to what's going on in Congress in Washington, D.C., right? But they can't pass the budget. They can't agree on anything, right? And if we're talking about raising the age, we're going to get a lot of pushback in 25 because it's a societal norm, right? Another thing my young opponents was talking about was taking away the rights if we raise the age, right? Because that's what we're talking about, raising the age. Right? So one of the things they fear that if we raise the age, we'll take their rights away. I'm here to tell you explicitly, right? We're not going to take any rights. We're going to provide protections. The protections that I myself wasn't provided. Now, this is my anecdotal evidence, but it's evidence nevertheless, right? I was a part of that 90%, according to the clean and plain dealer, I was part of that 90% of black males that were bound over in Cuyahoga County. I'm from Cleveland. I was bound over at 16. And when I was bound over, even though they adjudicated me as an adult, they gave me none of those rights that my young opponents were afraid to lose. I still wasn't able to vote. I still had to get permission to buy some cigarettes. I couldn't do any of the things that I wanted, but I can go to prison. And so what we're trying to say is we're going to break that. We're going to eliminate that. We're going to prevent children from being sent to prison. You know, when I got bonded over way back in the year of 1997, I know I don't look that old, but it's true. I was bound over back in 1997, and the year before I got to Madison, and this is when they were sending all the juveniles to Madison. The year before I got to Madison, make sure I'm not going over my time. The year before I got to Madison, uh, a young boy was killed by some juvenile, some adults that were incarcerated with us. Now we were separated, but they managed to get to the unit which we were housed in, take the keys from the CEOs, and stab this young boy to death. Imagine if he wasn't treated as an adult. He'd be a, he, who knows what he'll be doing right now, right? So we're talking about, let's raise the age to 21. And we say 21 because it's a start, right? Another thing that my young opponents was talking about was the military and, and the different laws that they have and the confusion that it would, it would create, right? The military, for everyone that doesn't know, the military has its own tribunal right now. They have their own code of laws right now. These people that are in the military are held to a different standard right now. We would change nothing if we raise the age. So let's raise the age. Again, let's not make the perfect the enemy of the good. But I agree we should 
the incarcerate. I agree that we should focus on the underlying causes of crime and that'll keep us all out of places like this. And since I only have 45 seconds, with that, I will glue. Excellent. Next up, we have our final rebuttal of the day from Indiana. So we're gonna get some Hoosier rebuttal here. Our next speaker's out of South Bend, Indiana, via Florida, where he grew up. He's studying history, journalism, and plans to study law later this year. And a fun fact about our next debater, he believes that debate matters because it's an excellent space for good faith and rational discussion of relevant issues. It's kind of close to our mission statement. So uh, right on point, we, we have the same values. So we're looking forward to hearing from our next debater. Please give a warm welcome to Mr. Kyler Logan. The core question in this debate is whether or not uh, the age should be raised to 21 to be tried as an adult. Um, but the key problem with my opponent's arguments has been that they have failed to articulate why the age of 21 is specifically important. Um, a lot of their psychological evidence suggests that 25 is the age that this uh, develops. And we have read evidence that shows that many people by the age of 18 and even some by the age of 15, well, they may not have full prefrontal cortex development, are able to understand the consequences of their actions and uh, be moral right from moral wrong. Um, we, yeah, they have not proved that uh, emergent adults um, are, have not developed this sense of right from wrong, which is key um, in prefrontal cortex development. Um, and under the first contention here. Uh, the channel plan, they have articulated that we agree that there are systemic issues with the justice system, that there are racial issues with the justice system that disproportionately affect uh, different populations. And we think that a key to solve this is a robust uh, legal reform that includes, as the planks that we've read, prohibiting things like mandatory minimums, having advisory boards, opening federal funds, and funding for post uh, incarceration programs. Um, this can help get at the root cause in a way that changing the age of 18 to 21 simply will not do. Um, on our second contention, uh, we, we talked explicitly about spillover and they have to some extent misunderstood our arguments here. Um, the military does have different uh, tribunals and different laws, but the problem is the misalignment alignment of those laws with our own domestic laws. If we in our country are telling people that they are not responsible for what they do from 18 to 21, uh, it can be used as a basis uh, to uh, get military people in the military excused of anything that they might do at that same age. Uh, that is how these arguments develop. They typically would use this as a reason uh, to to raise that age, and either way, it causes misalignment in our legal system that could cause confusion, and it would use a justification that could allow people to get away with crime. Um, yeah, on to the third contention here. Uh, oh, sorry, on the social spillover uh, and voter rights. This will be this can be used to take away other rights. I know they say that they're not advocating for that, but they have chosen the age of 21 specifically, and uh, that age is. is the age of 18 to 21, uh, people can have numerous rights taken away, uh, including even voting, uh, which that was not always set in stone. It used to be 21, so that specific age causes problem where it could be used as justification to take this away. Going on to contention three, this is uh, the most important reason why doing this immediately is bad. Um, they say that we are, are putting uh, retribution before rehabilitation, but that is not true. We've articulated that public safety is the most important part of the justice system. Uh, and that includes and involves rehabilitation, but if public safety is a priority. 40% um, of prison population is not a safety threat. So we are agreeing that uh, we can release people um, 
and not jeopardize public safety. Uh, we just disagree about how to do that. And these are the key reasons why it is better to do it through a broad system of reform, uh, including funding and uh, prohibitions of certain practices that are in the status quo. And instead, to instead of expanding a juvenile system that is currently failing, uh, number one key point here is the cost of the family. We have showed that parents are required to pay bills, sometimes up to one thousand a month, um, when juveniles are arrested. This would now apply to people eighteen through twenty-one, and uh, would increase this burden on families in the immediate term. Um, the collection of this debt is also particularly unaffected in the juvenile sector compared to the adult sector. We would not be able to uh, recover these costs, and in some cases, it might even cost more to get that debt uh, than the prison system makes. Uh, in addition, we um, the costs of youth confinement are higher and increasing. Uh, that's from the Justice Policy Institute. The average cost for the secure confinement of a young person is five hundred fifty-eight dollars per day, two hundred four thousand per year, a forty-four percent increase. Uh, instead of expanding the number of people in the juvenile system, causing problems, causing costs to the family, causing costs to the state, just for this age that is ultimately arbitrary and not supported by psychological evidence, um, risks putting these costs on society, on the state, on the families. Uh, instead, it is better to have broad legal reform that changes and fixes the problems of the justice system without having to treat 18 to 21 year old young adults as if they were children. Thank you. Thank you, Kyler. That wraps up the speaking section of this debate except for final remarks so we're now going to give both teams an opportunity to make closing remarks for 90 seconds each beginning with our affirmative team from liberation allowed so please we welcome to the lectern one more time mr tyru mcclendon Ty? We, the affirmative, have given specific evidence rationally on why the citizen jurisdiction should be 21 for emerging adults. Scientifically, if the brain isn't completely developed, then a human cannot be completely responsible for one's actions. Billions are being made from the mass incarceration industry, which influences politicians to create destructive policies, which persuade prosecutors' discretion away from restorative justice. Our solution says with scientific certainty that if youth are detained or rehabilitated within their own environment, that the recidivism rate would be lower, establishing public safety in our country. Some may say that this is all about the rule of law. Most judges may say that this is all about outside the law, but slavery was the law, interracial marriage was against the law, apartheid in South Africa was upheld by the law, the murder of black women and children by the Jim Crow law was ignored by the so-called real law, so the law isn't always right. We must be preventative, eliminating prosecutorial discretion, racial bias, and classism in this matter. In fact, it took people like yourselves to change the law and to restore humanity and to the system. And each of you, I know that there is a sacred part of being human. John Brown died for it. While evaluating this debate, ignore the paradoxes, judges, you are the law. Thank you. Okay, for the last word on today's debate, before we turn it over to the judges, one more again from Indiana University, please welcome Annika Fish. There we go. All right. Today you have to vote in favor of the, you have to vote in favor of mitigation in order to keep the age at 18. Top level, the biggest things that we need to consider are future implications of this law changing. 21 is an arbitrary number that is not even specifically in line with the evidence that talks about how 25 is actually when the brain is fully developed. 
The affirmative makes arguments about how it's going to be able to be changed in the future. However, look to the arguments which were made throughout the debate, which are talking about how smaller scale reforms inherently are just taken away and considered not actually a solution in the future. The only way to cause any future solutions is through mass decarceration, which is what the counter plan does. The counter plan encourages decarceration by 20% over three years. This means that we're going to have a solution to um, changing laws. We're going to have larger scale change, and it's actually going to increase reparative justice because rather than continuing the system as it is currently made, we're going to massively change it through the counter plan. Um, additionally, without this, you can still consider that spillover of laws still changes. Whether or not they are making specific stances on voting rights, the international law of war, it is still important to understand that changing the age from 18 to 21 will change the perception of adulthood legally and socially, which will cause uh, individuals to not continue to vote, won't be able to vote, and will make sure that international war crimes are not going to be able to be prosecuted because of confusion. Thank you. Okay. We also at the NPDL are a big supporters of mass decarceration. It's in our mission statement. We are all about decarcerating minds. As we send this debate over to the judges now to tally up scores, we're going to hear from some of our participants about this experience. And on the theme of decarceration, right, there's a lot of thought and theory and misconception about what prison is and what prison isn't. And I think anyone who tuned in today hopefully saw some of those barriers in their own minds come tumbling down because I don't think it's debatable at all that what you saw on display here is some very talented humanity that some sectors of our nation choose to devalue. That's crazy. So we here at the NPDL are all about illuminating human talent and building these bridges to community and to help us do so. We work in collaboration with our partners, both university partners like Indiana, who we'll hear from in a moment, but also our DOC partners. And I'd like to recognize on behalf of the NPDL community, a particular individual who without her efforts to support her team, none of this would have been possible today. She went above and beyond. So as the executive director of the National Prison Debate League, it's my honor to extend this leadership award to Jerrica Harrison of Ohio's Neo State. Would you like to say a few words to the people at home, Jerrica? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I appreciate this plaque. I truly enjoy everything that I do. I enjoy it helping those who want to help themselves and put them in a position to be able to further their thoughts and their minds and see those things come to light and come true. Um, working with these guys has been, it's been a long road. Um, it actually was presented to me by one of the fellows. It's like, as soon as I started working here, he was like, hey, I want to do a debate team. And I'm like, okay. I mean, like, <laughs> I didn't think you'd be interested in debate, but <laughs> so, I mean, he's been working super duper hard and getting these group of guys together and, I think, I think you all made, made, made it all come together and it, it was a good job. So, down here. I know what y'all at home are probably thinking, how did you get these dreads off that quick? But I'm not like, all right. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I went, I went to Ms. Harrison about three years ago and said I wanted to start a debate team and she said, okay, let's do it. So it started off with just guys in the back day room. My wife sent me some rules of debate, and we were just back there trying to figure it out, right? So how we usually do it, we break ourselves off, and we got three squads. We wanted to base it off Swahili principles, right? So we got the Mutundu, we got the Kijani, and we got the Nayusi, right? We call our debate Jada, right? So and we just did that for years and years. And then we end up actually throwing a debate for the compound, right? And it was a success. So someone came to me one day and said, this is thing called a National Prison Debate League. So I went to Ms. Harrison and asked her to 
go to the website and see if we could get a shot in doing it. And ever since we've been here, we've had Daniel, we had Patrick, and we've been learning a lot. And no matter how this debate goes today, like I would like to thank my opponents for the opportunity to come here and give me a new chance to talk to me. And I hope we can make this a thing and do it again. And, we, and I just want to give special thanks to my wife because she's been supporting me and supporting this club for so long. And every step of the way. And, and, and like I said, I just want to just thank everybody for coming out. I'd like to thank the administration for allowing us to even be here. You know, one, one thing I got to say about this and correct the institution is that if you want to actually do something here and you got a vision and you want to achieve something, this is the place that you can come to and do it. I know this ain't the ideal place to the driven. I don't know, don't know, don't think I'm saying that, right? But if you happen to end up here, <laughs> if you happen to end up here, like the, like the administration here will actually let you thrive. And I would like to give them one more hand of applause for that. Okay, I'm not going to talk too much. I'd like to bring some of the debaters up and maybe Daniel back up and let, let everybody else get some camera time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for taking on the Swahili. I was scared to death to try to pronounce that. I'm not going to front. That was that was a tough one. Um, let's let's do a little alternation while the judges tally. I'd like to hear from Indiana because I really want to acknowledge we focus on our teams. They're our teams. Right. But at the end of the day, we don't have a league without our partners. And these colleges, they, they drove here today from Indiana. They all got in a van and drove here. Not many people, not many people voluntarily give up their Friday to come and hang out in a prison. And I just much respect to all of you for real. So I'd like to, I'd like to uh, ask your coach to come say a few words about this experience and working in here. And you're welcome to alternate with the folks until the judges are ready to announce the winner. Brian Lecter, New Jersey. Uh, first, I just uh, want to thank everybody for this opportunity. Um, you know, while four and a half hours may seem like a long drive, quite honestly, uh, we're used to 10 hour drives to get to many of our competitions. And so this is one of the shortest commutes that we had all season. So, um, but, uh, you know, honestly, the debate topic is incredible. Um, the educational opportunities that debate provides uh, changed my life. I'm a fir first generation college student um, out of all of my extended family. So I come from a very working class background. Uh, and one of the things that I love seeing the family out here is, um, you know, my my parents, my extended family at no time would ever come in front of a microphone and speak in front of an audience. They would uh, melt um, quite literally at that opportunity. And, you know, for, for me, um, you know, growing up in Cheyenne, Wyoming, um, you know, my father was a diesel mechanic and my mom did some books uh, for a child care um, to go through college and the training that debate provided me as a competitive debater. Uh, I felt like I honestly woke up. It provided me with an opportunity to see things through different lights, the controversies that public policymakers, but as well as some of the most vulnerable populations tend to go through, um, help build, I think, a sense of both empathy and connection to populations that either don't look like me um, or may not come from a similar background. Uh, and so when I now stand in front of students at Indiana University and I call colleagues um, from Harvard University, from Yale, uh, my own, I, I put much of that into the experience of coming in front of this microphone and challenging myself to understand arguments from uh, various perspectives. Uh, and so, you know, what I would say is, is that we're seeing a lot of erosions of democratic norms across this country and many areas across the world. And programs like this are more valuable than I think any of the experience that maybe our students um, may have doing anything else on their Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. So we, you know, you don't have to thank us as much as uh, we're thanking you for giving us this opportunity. Um, so with that, you know, I just want to say, you know, sitting back and listening to you all speak, I feel like I almost see a symbol to your soul, maybe from the reverence coming through. Um, and the rhetorical styles, the, the way that you approach arguments, I think are uh, important learning outcomes for the style of debate that our students tend to engage with, which is often academic and very analytical. Uh, and so opening ourselves up to that, regardless of the arguments, the topic itself, I think are extremely invaluable. So again, you know, thank you. It was a great experience and we look forward to doing it again.
Thank you, Brian. And I just want to let everyone know, especially the viewers at home, who've been patiently waiting for the actual result of the debate, we've already kind of moved on, but uh, the, the decision is in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask for brief remarks from one of each of the participants from each team, and then we're going to let the judges, uh, Chief Judge Ed Panetta and the other judges take over, announce the winner, and we'll present the trophy and call it a day. So Michael, would you come up and represent Liberation Aloud? And then you guys can decide who you'd like to represent. Okay, so. I just want to come up here and say thank you to everybody who came and showed up, to our opponents, to the administration on behalf of my team. We appreciate it. I want to give a special thanks to my teammates who didn't get to come up here and speak because they've been boxing with us for weeks on end. So we've been going at it two, three times a week. So it's more than just the five who you see who came up here to speak. So I would like to give them a round of applause because we really appreciate that. Thank my family for showing up and everyone. We appreciate this, and like I said, hopefully we can do this again. Thank you. Um, I just want to thank you all for coming out here and taking the time to do the research and learn and learn how to do debate. Debate has changed a lot about me throughout my life. I've only been doing it for three years, but it really changed the way that I perceive education, the way that I perceive other people. And Brian is right about the style of speaking that you all used. Because you heard us, we sound like mad nerds. Like, that is not the normal way of speaking in public. And so being able to take the skills that you are getting from this and use it conversationally is so much, it's so, so important. Um, I work with high schoolers and try and teach them the same kind of debate stuff that you all are learning here. And I think that it's really important that we all make those connections. I also wanna let you know that we hosted the American Debate Association tournament just a couple of weeks back. And there was a speaker who talked about how we were going to come here and do this. And the room erupted into applause. This is not forgotten, this is important. And the rest of the debate community, the rest of the world does recognize that. Thank you. Very well said. And honestly, like, I hope that all of you who have the privilege to leave today, myself included, we never lose sight of that humanity when we walk out those doors because there's so many people who don't get these opportunities. And we hope to continue to expand our league. We have uh, some, some more events in spring in DC coming up, and that'll pretty much wrap up most of our spring season. But we, we're international now. We're in Finland. We're going to be launching new states in the fall. So we're very excited. And every time we get the opportunity to actually build bridges, as I said earlier, uh, we're fulfilling our mission. And it's about people. We're a people-centered organization built by system-impacted people for system-impacted people. We're not saviors. We just care. And we're going to keep showing up for people and trying to trying to break down these walls. So let's see how the, uh, the judges actually scored the debate. And we'll wrap this up today. So Chief Judge Ed Lee and the other judges, James and... Um, Carly, if you have any remarks you'd like to make to the teams before the winners announce, the floor is yours. Great. Uh, first, let me thank everybody for participating. Uh, it was really a lot of fun to watch the debate. Uh, and uh, I, I've been involved in prison debates for over 45 years. I actually did something with John Katsoulis at the Malcolm X Debate Prison uh, Society in Norfolk, Massachusetts. Uh, where Malcolm X founded that debate program in 1953. Uh, and I've seen a bunch of these debates. And this one I found to be quite good because it was actually a lot of clash uh, and people tried to answer one another's arguments rather than just reading particular scripts, which is a fundamental element of debate. And so before I announce the decision, I'll first turn to Carly and then to James to let them add whatever comments they might have. Yeah, thank you all so much for letting me have the opportunity to be a part of this. Um, I really enjoyed the debate. And, and like Dr. Panetta said, I think it was really a testament to engagement. Everybody was really listening to what the other team was saying and then making an attempt to refute that in a way that was really nice to see. And um for the affirmative in particular, I just thought it was a real testament to advocacy. I thought the negative did a good job of providing some analytical arguments in support of, of their policy, but um, 
the affirmative uh, was was very persuasive as advocates for for their um, their resolution. And so I, I think you all have really a lot to be proud of in this debate on both sides. It was it was really um, cool to watch. So Carly, as a, as a former national champion, can I ask you a question? Are you saying that there were no losers here today? <laughs> Yes, it would be. It, it's completely <laughs> accurate to say there are no losers. I, I and I feel like a winner too. I know that's kind of cheesy, but I I really enjoyed the experience, and everybody should be really proud of how they prepared and and executed on on a really complex topic. Thank you. Awesome. Um, I just want to just say I am extremely extremely thankful and grateful. Uh, for being offered the opportunity to be uh, a part of this. Uh, I am, I'm a little bit smarter now than what I was a couple of hours ago. <laughs> and, uh, and that is, and that is all due to the participants in this debate. Uh, I just want to just take a moment and just say how profound it is for us to be able, despite our differences, despite our different social locations, that we find ourselves in this moment right now being able to connect around something called debate. And uh, I hope that every participant today does not lose uh, this particular moment and can reflect on it going forward about how powerful it is when people, despite who you are, where you come from, can come together and engage in intellectual dialogue and discussion. It truly is transformative. It is truly the key to being able to build community and be able to understand each other beyond labels and stereotypes and be able to grow as human beings. Uh, my grandmother used to always say, you're either growing up or growing old. And uh, debate helps you grow up as you grow old. <laughs> and, uh, so I just like, I just want to just encourage everybody, just like Carly and Dr. Panetta, uh, I just, I hope I get a chance to address some more of these debates. Uh, this is my first one, but I am truly uh, blown away by the argument, the discourse, the rhetoric, the presentation that was demonstrated today. Uh, all of you are intellectual giants in my book, and uh, you all have the gifts, the talents that, to really be transformative in whatever space you may find yourself in. And I just encourage you to continue to use your gifts. Uh, this debate was... Uh, was just really a testament to what hard work and putting argument and ideas together. And uh, I really am fortunate to have had a chance. In this debate, um, similar to what Carly said, I thought the affirmative was just uh, amazing with their presentation styles, uh, just to bring in a mixture of both anecdotal evidence and um, quantitative evidence to the to forefront in this debate. And uh, it really was uh, just really great on both sides. So I could talk going on, on and on. I'm not I'm not uh, short winded like like I forget one of our our debaters on, on from the affirmative as a preacher. I, I, I'm a PK, so I, I, I like to talk, too, but I won't raise the offering today. So I'll turn it back over to, to, to everybody and uh, just thank you again for the opportunity to judge this debate. Thank you, James. Uh, I thank my colleagues for their uh thoughtful responses, and the decision was a unanimous one for the affirmative. Deliberation arrived. You guys should go shake their hands. Hi, Mom. <laughs> Okay, y'all. We'll see y'all next time. Check out npdl.org and our YouTube channel for the video. Take care, y'all.